Hello, everyone. What I want to do is discuss the uh, very important uh, calderon zygmunt decomposition, which uh, really is at the cornerstone of modern um, uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, it's a very important uh, research tool uh, used in a lot of different uh, areas in analysis. Um, and to do that, we first need uh, what's called the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, which is uh, much older. So this calderon zygmunt decomposition uh, is from the 1950s, um, and Lebesgue differentiation theorem is from the early 1900s, uh, and it is the same Lebesgue as Lebesgue measure. Um, so he, he did quite a bit, a lot of stuff, Lebesgue, um, very prolific guy. Um, okay, and so what's the Lebesgue differentiation theorem? Well, let's say F is an L1 of the real line. Uh, basically, the same proof works for higher dimensions. And I should mention everything in the video I just did, more or less with very minor modifications, works for higher dimensions. Um, so for almost every X in R, we have that this limit here, is going to be uh, zero. Okay. So uh, we are just looking at this limit here. So here, uh, f of x is just a constant with respect to integration. Okay. And what's the significance of this? Uh, well, in particular, uh, for almost every x in R, we have f of x is this limit here. And this is basically uh, one of the fundamental theorems of calculus for um, uh, Lebesgue L1 functions. Um, we'll actually make that more precise, uh, but yeah, this is practically saying you can, uh, for almost every x, you can differentiate um, an integral to get the function back. And this is uh, f of x. Uh, so how does this here come from this? Uh, let's just take a quick uh, look and see. Okay, so, uh, right, uh, what the hell, leave it as blue. So let's say I want to look at this uh, right here. And I wanna show that this goes to zero as uh, R goes to um, zero. So uh, for the purposes of integration, f of x is constant, so I can bring it inside. Uh, so what I mean by that is, and this is a little easy trick you do quite often. Well, we've, I'm sorry, we, we've done this before. We've done things like this before. Um, so this is yet another instance where we're doing this. So right, I'm just writing f of x as basically 2r over 2r. What I just wrote here is basically, uh, if I stick a dy here, this is exactly f of x, okay? Right, so it's f of x. Uh, well, um, I still want this integral here. So this is, these two are equal. And now I just smash in absolute values. to get the following. Well, really in the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, it's f of y minus f of x, but it doesn't matter, okay? And we're gonna prove that this goes to zero uh, as r goes to zero for almost every x, okay? So actually this is so, yeah, this uh, here is, is definitely a stronger, um, or rather this going to zero for almost every uh, x is definitely stronger than saying this is true. So we're proving a pretty strong uh, statement. And what I really like about this is the proof illustrates where maximal functions very naturally uh, just pop up. Okay. So, I mean, this result is very important, but I really like the proof 
uh, addition, in addition to, you know, just proving something that's really, you know, something that's really important. Okay, so what is the proof? Let's say, um, and actually the proof I'm uh, going through is from um, Rudin's real and complex analysis. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So uh, let's say TRF of X is this function here. Um, no issues on anything. F is L1, so this is perfectly well defined. It's a real number. Um, no, it's a, it's a non-negative number. Um, and let's say TF is this limb soup, okay? Uh, just like with the hardy littlewood maximal function, this, uh, all we know is that this is uh, between zero and infinity, and it could be infinity. It's possible. All right. Okay. So I claim that the measure where this is zero or sorry, the measure where this is bigger than zero, and this should be bigger than zero, is zero. So how would I prove this? Well, it's just standard, um, you know, standard 510A stuff. This is the measure of um, the union, uh, n equals one to infinity, the brackets here x such that tf of x is bigger than one over n. Uh, if it's bigger than zero, it's got to be bigger than one over n for some n. So this is less than or equal to this sum here. Um, try to squeeze this in. Well, I don't have room for brackets, but hopefully it doesn't cause anyone any distress. Uh, so TF Okay, so uh, this will be zero if I can prove that for any positive lambda This measure here is zero in particular each one of these will be zero. So this is my task Okay, so by baby 510a stuff. Uh, to prove this here, I just need to prove uh, the same thing except with zero replaced by some positive lambda, um, which is very important. Um, I mean, you've did things like this in 510a for um, convergence and measure results, uh, but anyway. Okay, right, and we have to be able to do this for any lambda positive, no matter how small it is. All right, so let's say epsilon is bigger than zero and let's pick a continuous function G on the real line where the L1 norm of F minus G is less than epsilon. And let's say H is F minus G, so we trivially have F is, well, H, or rather G, that matters, but G, plus h. Okay, so um, TRF is fairly trivially sublinear. Um, you're just doing triangle inequality when you plop in f uh, and you know it's just TRG plus TRH. TRF is less than or equal to TRG plus TRH. Again, just uh, use this definition here and just plop in f equals um, g plus h. Not much to this. Okay, right. So what is trh? Trh, use triangle inequality again. Um, right, so trf, well, in general, trf, if, you know, this whole thing here, uh, is less than or equal to absolute value of f of x plus absolute value f of y. Okay. So this is all going to be less than or equal to, um, well, 
you integrate f of x with respect to y, it's just a constant. So it's just from x minus r to x plus r, you get 2r divided by 2r is just 1. So it's f of x, an absolute value, plus uh, 1 over 2r. So it's a fairly crude estimate, but uh, I mean, there is depth here. And this should look familiar. So do the same thing except with H, TRH. Okay, well, I kind of spoiled it already, but sorry about that. So the point here is that, well, how do we handle different R's? How do we handle both little R, big R, medium R, medium big R, whatever? And the answer is we, we just don't. We don't. We, we can't. We can't handle just different R's in different ways. We just say, well, whatever this is, whatever R is, it's certainly less than or equal to the soup. And the soup of this thing here is the maximal function. Okay, so um, we've eliminated this R dependence right here okay, by just going to the maximal function. And this just happens all the time in different uh areas of analysis where you you have basically an average like this uh instead of just handling all these different r's you just say to hell with it just take the soup that's the maximal function we know nice things about maximal functions and that's that's that okay so what i can do um is well now let me take the uh limb soup of everything uh, right here, right here. I'm gonna take the limb soup of everything here. Hopefully this will not turn everything black. Very good. Okay, so TRH. Okay. And the uh, key point here is that when I let R go to zero, take the limp soup as R goes to zero, this one here, TRG, is zero. And that's nothing subtle here. Um, so let me get rid of all this. So certainly if F is continuous, there's no, you know, it's, uh, for fixed x, if f is continuous, this is going to be obviously zero because continuity says f of y on this tiny little neighborhood of x is basically f of x. And you can just quantify that by epsilon delta stuff. Like, like you know, saying, you know, saying this uh, trf goes to zero if f is continuous as r goes to zero, that's basically 312, it's basic analysis. So when R goes to zero, TRG uh, is zero, okay? And we have this estimate for TRH, so all we're left with is, well, again, this goes to zero, so we're just left with this stuff here, okay? And this puts us in a really good position because if we wanna take uh, this set here, all x and r, where tf of x is bigger than lambda. As we've seen before, um, that's a subset of the union of these two because, um, well, you know, take really just the comp, the, the intersection of the complements is a subset of the left hand side. If x is not in either of these, then tf of x is equal to mx, mh of x, absolute value of h of x, which is less than or equal to lambda over two plus lambda over two is lambda. So as we've done before, we fairly trivially have this. Uh, um, uh, yeah. This is a subset of the union here. Okay. Or in other words, if x is on the left-hand side, then x has to be in one of these. Otherwise, tf of x, because of this here is going to be less than or equal to um, uh, lambda over two plus lambda over two, which is lambda. And this should be a lambda. All right, so take measures, use countable subadditivity, 
But this uh, maximal function is weak type 1, 1. This is just Chebyshev's inequality here, nothing to that. So let's say C is the constant for uh, the weak type 1, 1 bounds for the maximal function. I think it was actually like 8, not very subtle, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so this is just going to be 2 C1. Um, sorry, 2 C1 over lambda times the L1 norm of H. But remember, H, we picked A, and we, well, the L1 norm of H is the L1 norm of F minus G. And remember, we picked G, this continuous function, in such a way that this is less than epsilon. All right. Well, there's no epsilon here. This whole thing here, nothing, epsilon has nothing to do with anything here whatsoever at all. So uh, we can let epsilon go to zero to get that this measure here, in fact, has no choice but to be zero. Right. So really, really slick proof in my opinion. And this is arbitrary. All right. Right. So, um, yeah, a typical uh, example of how to use uh, the Hardy Littlewood maximal function. And it just, yeah, I mean, it's in a lot of different areas, a lot of different estimates. You just have averages. And if you can't really, or not even can, if you just don't want to handle different averages, just say it's less than or equal to the maximal function. Um, especially when proving LP boundedness of certain objects. We know the maximal function is bounded on LP from last lecture. Um, but anyway. All right, so a corollary is a fundamental theorem of calculus for L1 functions. Say F is an L1. And when with this integral here, A can be minus infinity. That's not a problem. So for almost every x and r, big F is differentiable, and f prime of x is little f of x. So what's the proof? Um, literally, just write down the difference quotient. This is uh, big F of x plus r over r. This is big F of x over r right here. This is f of x. Well, these two integrals become, um, you're subtracting, so it's x to x plus r. And again, we write this as um, integral x to x plus r, f of x dy over r, because it's a constant with respect to y integration. So we don't get exactly what uh, we had before, but we basically um, almost do. Now let's smash an absolute values like we did before. Uh, certainly this is less than or equal to uh, putting an x minus r. We're enlarging the uh, limits of integration. Uh, we really want a 2r here. Well, it's trivial. Just multiply and divide by 2. By Lebesgue differentiation theorem, we know for almost every x, this goes to 0 as r goes to 0. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's how you prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, the other fundamental theorem is a lot different. Uh, we don't really need that. Uh, but um, I think it's f is absolutely continuous uh, if and only if. Um, uh, it's differentiable almost everywhere, and uh, you can integrate the derivative to get the function back, something like that. But anyway, uh, that's in Royden. Um, I actually don't remember how Royden proves this, um, this kind of half of the fundamental theorem. I'm curious to look it up. But anyway, all right, so let's talk about the calderon zygmund decomposition. We've done a lot of the hard work already with this. Now it's just kind of putting things together. And what this is, is a very useful, clever way to um, basically decompose any L1 function into 
two pieces. It's a bit silly, but we define, we, we decompose uh, this L1 function into a uh, good piece and a bad piece. Um, I, I, you know, I guess, I don't know, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's silly to just say something is good and something is bad, but okay. So what is the Calderon Zygmunda composition? Sorry, this came out so uh, crappy here, but uh, so let's just say we have the, the Calderon Zygmunda intervals of height lambda, and I'll remind you what those are in a second. And you don't have to have F non-negatives almost everywhere, but typically, um, if you look in another book, uh, and most books on harmonic analysis have this because it's so important. Um, yeah, most books will just say, well, let's assume F is bigger or equal to zero. So, Okay, so the claim here, there's a few things here, and this is kind of the first step towards calderon Zygmunt decomposition. Well, f of x is less than or equal to, uh, sorry, uh, no, that's right. f of x is less than or equal to lambda uh, for almost every x away from these calderon zygmunt cubes. Uh, not cubes. Uh, again, I use these, you know, I use calderon zygmunt cubes in my work all the time, so I always call them cubes, but they're intervals. Um, and just like everything we're doing, this basically works in higher dimensions. Um, no problem. Okay. Something we actually already proved. So remember, these are disjoint. So the union is just the sum of the measures and the interval. So that's the lengths. And this is less than or equal to the L1 norm of F of lambda. Okay. And three, um, well, the average of f on each of these intervals is bigger than lambda and less than or equal to two lambda. So let's see why. Well, you, know, you should understand at least this part if you remember anything from the last video, uh, but anyway. All right, so what are these? Well, remember that these QJs are exactly by definition, all dyadic intervals in script C that are maximal, meaning that for any other dyadic uh, interval containing P, strictly larger than P, we have that dyadic interval is not in script C. So these are maximal, um, dyadic intervals satisfying this condition here, okay? Okay, so this remember is what script C is. It's all dyadic intervals where this average is bigger than lambda. Okay, so we already proved two. Um, so I don't wanna say more about that. We, we proved this in the last video. It was not quick and it, it took work, but we did it. Um, better, better looking lambda, but uh, sorry about that. Anyway, so let's prove one. Okay, and um, one is basically the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So, uh, and this is something you do often in, in modern Fourier analysis. This kind of analysis. So fix an x, uh, or, or take, so uh, we know for almost every x, the Lebesgue differentiation theorem holds. So for any of those x in this, uh, uh, this, this set of, you know, this set here, um, pick i, k, and d, k. So pick a dyadic interval of length one over two to the k where x, where i k contains x. We're doing this for fixed x, okay? So fairly trivially that means, uh, well, x is, in each of each in, x is in each of these. dk, script dk partitions the real line. So there's always a dyadic interval of length one over two to the k that contains x. Because the length of these intervals is one over two to the k, um, 
you can't have anything more than just x in all these intervals. Um, that's fairly, basically it's a nested interval theorem. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the, basically you would have uh, uh, the length of, I mean, it, yeah, because uh, these just uh, shrink um, to zero, this is only going to contain script X. It's not going to contain any other point uh, at all. Okay. Um, right. Um, yeah, I mean, and if you have any doubts, uh, I mean, you can just assume there's two points in this. Uh, pick K so small that, or sorry, pick K so large that one over two to the K is smaller than the distance between two points that you think are in this intersection, you get a contradiction. Uh, anyway, all right, so let me just draw what's going on. If uh, your picture is worth a thousand words. Um, okay. All right, so um, yeah, I'll just draw uh, three levels like I usually do give you the idea here very clearly. Um, so I don't know, let's say this is the k, k plus one, plus two. All right, so we have these intervals here, width uh, of each one uh, to the minus k, that's the width. Okay, so uh, we have, well, take halves. So each one of these has two uh, dyadic children. Each one of these has two children. Et cetera, et cetera. So just, I don't know, take uh, X uh, right here. What the hell? It's as good as any other place, really. Um, okay, so right. Uh, this is the dyadic interval of, uh, this is the dyadic interval in dk plus 2 that contains x. This is dyadic interval that contains uh, x in dk plus 1, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we just keep picking these uh, intervals, okay? All right. Uh, so let's go back. So basically, not exactly, but just like uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus was a virtually trivial consequence of a vague differentiation theorem, so too is this, and if you doubt that, fill in the very, very, very easy details. But basically by a Lebesgue differentiation theorem, uh, f of x is going to be this limit here, okay? Well, so what? Well, I claim now that if x is not in this union, then for all k, each one of these has to be less than or equal to lambda. Okay. And this is actually really, really easy. Why is it really easy? Well, if not, then it's bigger than lambda. Okay, not a profound realization here. That means by definition, it's in script C. Remember, script C is literally all dyadic intervals where the average of f, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, well, sorry, f is bigger or equal to zero. So the average of f is bigger than lambda. All right. Well, remember what the QJs are. They're, they're maximal intervals. Um, they're maximal intervals that are in script C. So every interval in script C is contained in a maximal one. It, IK itself, again, could be maximal. 
But every one of them, everything in script C is certainly contained in a maximal um, element of script C. Again, what does maximal mean? Uh, take any dyadic interval uh, strictly containing um, IK, uh, or you know, what does maximal mean? Uh, let's let's say uh, let's say you know so QJ prime let's say is a maximal uh, element in script C uh, containing IK. QJ prime are exactly the maximal element in script C. Okay, and what does that mean again? Well, take anything any dyadic interval strictly containing QJ prime, then that dyadic interval is not in script C. Okay, that's what maximal. Right. Okay, well, that means X is an IK. That's how we picked IK. IK is a subset of QJ prime. Whatever QJ prime is, that means IK is uh, a subset of this union here. Well, that, that doesn't really fly well with this here. This is impossible. So that, that's a contradiction, because we're assuming X is not in this, or rather, it's just impossible. So the point here is that this has to be true. All right, so F of X is this limit here. Each one of these is lambda. So this is less than or equal to lambda. So away from this union, F of X is nice and bounded. All right, so let's remember what three is. And three is very easy, but it's, it's something you do all the time in, in your modern Fourier analysis. Okay, so, right. So remember what these QJs are. As I mentioned, they are maximal elements in script C. So in particular, they are in script C. So by definition, this is true. We already used this a few times. On the other hand, now let's use maximality in a not terribly clever way. Let's take uh, the um, parent of QJ. Uh, whoops, that. So the parent is not much bigger than QJ. It's only, the length is only twice that of the length of QJ, but it still is strictly uh, bigger than QJ. By maximality, QJ tilde, the parent of QJ, is not in script C. That's the definition of maximality. Anything larger than QJ does not satisfy this condition. All right, so what does this mean? Well, this means that, yeah, this is bigger than lambda, but it's, it's well, let's see what it means besides just this, okay? Well, Q, uh, J is uh, a subset of Q, J tilde. So we can say this is less than or equal to, um, uh, basically get rid of this and make it a Q tilde J. Okay, so we do that. Uh, but these two are equal. Maybe get rid of this. It's confusing here. Right, so, right, uh, yeah, QJ is a subset of Q tilde J. These two are equal. The length of, um, uh, uh, the length of QJ tilde is twice that of the length of QJ. So you take one over L of QJ, that's two over L of QJ tilde. Right, so, uh, right, well, what good is that? Well, again, this is less than or equal to at lambda because QJ tilde, I'm sorry to say, is not in this wonderful uh, Member this wonderful uh, party here of script C. 
that's Q tilde J is not in script C, so this average is less than or equal to lambda. So it's two times lambda. So this is the way you should think is kind of like a weird balance of, well, these QJs are good and bad, kind of, you know, they're, um, I mean, they're kind of bad because F is large average, but they're kind of good. They're not so bad because, well, F doesn't have that large of average on the QJs. They're good because, well, they, they have small, they're small, the, the union is small, QJs, and they're really not that bad because F away from the QJs is really nice, F is bound. Um, anyway, all right, so let's uh, finish this video up with the actual calderon zygmunt decomposition. Okay. So this here is what most people refer to as the calderon zygmunt decomposition of a non-negative function at height lambda. So of course, behind the scenes, we're uh, doing all this for every single different lambda, um, but we, you know, no, you know, we don't really uh, emphasize, there's no need to emphasize lambda dependence, so why? Sully up the uh, notation. All right, so take lambda positive F and L1, take these Calderon Zygmunt intervals, then one and three are true, what we had just in the previous lemma. Okay, so further, let's define this good function. Uh, so it should be to emphasize that these are disjoint. All right, so let's say G is F if X is not in this union. And if X is in this union, let's say it's just the average of F over QJ. And let's say the bad function is F minus G. Well, that obviously means that F, actually trivially just add G to both sides, F is uh, G plus B. Right. So yeah, nothing, nothing there. Okay. Well, so G and B satisfy a whole bunch of conditions, or uh, sorry, satisfy a whole bunch of nice properties. G is really nice. It's L infinity norm is less than or equal to two lambda. Uh, this is over R, and the L one norm is less than or equal to the L1 norm of S. The bad function satisfies the following. It can be written as a sum of BJs, where BJ is supported, um, sorry, this should be, it's uh, zero for X not in QJ. It's supported on QJ. The average, or really just integrating BJ over QJ, if you do that, you get zero, and this is really, really important. Um, okay. On the other hand, uh, when you integrate the absolute value of bj, it's not too bad. It could be big, but it's, it's four lambda length of qj. Okay. All right, so what's the proof? Uh, so let's prove a first. If x is not in this union here, well, we already uh, proved a moment ago that by definition, G of X is F of X. And if, if we're not, and for almost every X uh, away from this union, F of X is less than or equal to lambda, okay? Now, on the other hand, if X is in one of these QJs, the disjoint, so if X is in the union, it's in only one of these. So then what's G of X? G of X is this average here, and we proved moment ago that this is this average here is less than or equal to not quite lambda it's bigger than lambda but the next best thing uh, it's less than or equal to two lambda okay so either x is in this union or x is not in this union either way 
um, g of x is bounded above by two lambda. So this nice good function is has L infinity norm less than or equal to uh, two lambda. And yeah, I couldn't, I actually uh, wasn't able to squeeze uh, uh, this part in. So let me just uh, prove it very quickly. Uh, there's really not a whole lot to it. Uh, so integrate g of y. Uh, so first of all, I should mention f is assumed non-negative, so everything is non-negative here. Okay, so uh, this is going to be equal to um, well, integrate over the QJs. <clears throat> Uh, da, 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 da. So, yeah, g of y dy. Uh, whoops, I, uh, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, now take away the qj's. Uh, g of y dy. Okay, so, um, well, right, so I can write this as a sum because the QJs are disjoint. All right, so it's not very subtle what happens if I integrate G of X over QJ. or g of y rather over qj. On qj, this is a constant. I integrate a constant over qj, I just get the length of qj. So the length gets canceled with this one over L of qj. So this is just integral qj f of y dy. Okay. Um, sorry about that, my mouse fell. Okay, um, right, so this literally here is, uh, as we just saw a second ago, same thing as f of y. Integra the integral of, uh, of g over qj is the integral of f over qj, right? Okay, well, on this set, g is defined to be f. So fairly trivially, uh, we get the second part. Uh, yeah, so f of y. So actually they're equal. Sorry about that. Uh, usually people just say, uh, it's less than or equal to, but they're actually equal, uh, the L1 norm of G and the L1 norm of F. Uh, let's get rid of that. Uh, okay, so we proved A, now let's prove B. Um, right, so first of all, uh, let's see what B is. Um, so B is F minus G, okay? Well, if we're away from this union here, then G is F. So uh, this is just F minus F. So this is zero away from this union here, okay? So now for X and QJ, let's write exactly what B of X is. Well, it's f of x minus g of x, and g of x for x and qj is by definition this average here, okay? So what we can do is write b of x as, um, well, just the sum over these here. So this is notation, because it's kind of a pain to keep writing one over L of qj, uh, we often, uh, right, kind of like a dash here. Some people put this on an angle, some people do it horizontal. 
But if you see a dash here, that, that means average. Um, well, do it like that. I'll just look it out. Make this red here. And yeah, this is really for any set of non-zero measure. Um, you know, the, when you have a dash here, you're just dividing by one over the measure of whatever the set is. Um, right, and, and again, I can do this because the QJs are um, uh, disjoint. Okay, so, um, Right, so this is really, for any fixed x, this is not really an infinite sum. Uh, it's really either zero if x is um, not in the union, which is exactly what we want, we just saw that. Or if x is in the union, then for that one single x, that's why that one single j where x is in qj, this is just going to be f of x minus the average, okay? Right, so we can write b as this infinite sum. Right. We integrate uh, this over qj. Well, uh, we integrate the average, we just get integral of qj of f of y. Well, we integrate f of x over qj, we just get integral of f of x dx, same thing as f of y dy. So either this is trivially zero. Okay, so uh, right, the, uh, you integrate over qj, bj, you get zero. And B can be written as the sum here. All right, and finally, uh, let's just smash in absolute values. Uh, all right, so this is just something that didn't get erased well. Um, right, so yeah, the smash in absolute values. Uh, you basically get two times the integral of qj of f of y dy, and do the same uh, multiplication and division. This average here is less than or equal to two lambda. We did that a um, few times already. So it's four uh, length of qj times lambda. Okay, and that finishes up the proof of the calderon zygmunt decomposition. So this is really the, the key tool to proving um, that the Hilbert transform is weak type 1-1. One, one. And this is really the key tool to proving a lot of, that a lot of very useful, important uh, integral operators that arise when you study all different kinds of, of analysis, uh, from PDEs to, uh, uh, the Hardy space on the unit sphere to you know, a lot of different areas. This is the key to proving that these operators are bounded on LP uh, for P um, uh, bigger than one. And actually, uh, in the context of the Hardy space, um, you can actually, if you want, look in this book here, Keheju's uh, Spaces of Holomorphic Functions in Unit Ball. It's backwards, but um, they actually do a calderon zygmunt decomp, or he does a calderon zygmunt decomposition for the unit sphere in higher dimensions. Uh, the geometry is more complicated, but the basic idea is the same as what we're doing. And he uses that to prove uh, the, you know, weak type, weak one, weak type one, one bounds for the uh, Hardy space projection. Um, uh, and, and he uses that to prove that the Hardy space projection is bounded on L, um, LP. I mean, or maybe it's much more simple to do that uh, on the unit circle, where basically everything we're doing more or less proves, more or less works on a unit circle with, um, I mean, actually things are a little easier on a unit circle than what we're doing slightly. But yeah, basically everything we're doing works on a unit circle. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, and the homework did talk about the Hardy space projection. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that maybe in the last video or two. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> all right, uh, enough of that. So long, take care until next time.